Hello, 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 everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our session today about future of securities, digital securities to be exact. So thanks everyone for joining so far. Okay, our session has been very exciting over the last week. So today is day four already. You know, so we had just to recap day one and day two uh, talking about ESG fintech, day three about asset and wealth management. And today has been a, a very eventful day so far, although it's only 11 a.m. We already had a few different sessions about digital securities. So of course for this panel, okay, I'm very, very, very fortunate. I think I'm the luckiest person in the room right now to be joined by three very prolific guest panelists. <clears throat> so we have Jim Tay from OCBC, Ji Ching from uh, Stanchart, and Andrew Wong from UBS. So I'll let each one of these panelists uh, introduce themselves shortly. Okay, but okay, just, just before we begin, okay, let's just to, to remind everyone that we have the uh, Q&A and chat function on your right-hand side. So if any time you have a certain burning question, okay, just feel free to type it in so that I'm able to see it. Okay, and we will un uh, answer these questions as we go along. Okay, so back to the session. Okay, again, we have an exciting session today. It's called the future of digital securities and how are banks preparing for it? And of course, we have three uh, very established leaders from the banking sector. I will invite them now to introduce themselves. Uh, over to you first, Jim. Yeah, thanks so much, Ben. Yes, yes. First off, I want to congratulate you for uh, excellent event and all the many announcements. So this is this is this must be a really exciting week for, for you, you and your company. So I'm uh, Jim um, from the OCBC strategic planning team. So basically, we're responsible for driving strategic initiatives for the for the OCBC group. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'd like to invite Ji Ching. Uh, yeah, hi, Ben. Uh, and, and thanks again for, for having us today. Uh, very excited for uh, the, the exchange of, of thoughts that we will have today. Uh, so my name is Ji Chen. I'm based in Singapore. I work for Standard Chartered and uh, I'm the global product head for custody services. Uh, and, you know, at, very close to my heart is, is obviously the future of security services, including, you know, how we uh, as financial institutions would play a role in the uh, space of the digital assets. Wonderful. And Andrew. Thanks, Ben. And uh, thanks for inviting us as well. And congratulations on, on a number of the major announcements this week. Uh, also excited to be here on the panel today. Um, so just a quick introduction. I work in our APAC strategy team for UBS covering uh, the cross-divisional strategy for, for us here in APAC across our 13 markets and three uh, major uh, business divisions here. Thanks very much, Andrew, and uh, thanks for the kind words too. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, the topic of today is about digital securities. So I think, again, uh, just to emphasize, I think we are uh, very excited and also very lucky to have three of you on board this panel. Okay, so I'd like to kick off by having the first question, you know, which is a more uh, macro question about digital securities. Okay, which is, you know, if you look at the last 12 to 24 months, what are some trends that you have seen, okay, in your respective fields, okay, when it comes to this landscape of digital assets, including digital securities? Will any one of you want to kick off? Oh, I can I can start if you if, if you want. Um, yeah, I mean I mean it has been a, a very interesting twelve to twenty four months. And actually, if I reflect even going back three or four years ago, uh, I remember being attending you know seniors industry forum on the security side where you know people were still wondering what was DLT and what was blockchain and is blockchain crypto is is Bitcoin DLT and and so on. And I think where we've landed over the last twelve to fourteen months, twenty four months is actually a better understanding of the overall environment of what digital assets means and to your point that digital securities is one digital asset or one form of digital asset but there is probably a much wider spectrum right it comes from a completely unregulated unpermission type of uh, bitcoin cryptocurrencies to something that can be very uh, you know central bank issued cbdc and so you, you have everything in between um, and concurrently i think there is also uh, an increased interest and appetite from institutional investors to go into that space or to at least explore um, uh, 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 those digital assets and those digital securities. And therefore, there is also an increase of POCs and also an increase of regulation that will probably uh, uh, speak in, uh, you know, uh, in, in the next few minutes. Mm, interesting. I still remember some of those conferences back in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have anything to add on that? Yeah, yeah maybe. Uh, go ahead. No, no, Jim, please, please go ahead. Yeah. Sure. So, so definitely uh, echo what uh, Jijen has mentioned. So there's been so much development. I still remember 
the earlier Singapore FinTech Festival many years ago, talking about ICOs and it's, it's parked in this dingy little corner of, of the, the, the conference. And uh, it's really small area allocated, um, but it was just packed to the brim, right? And everyone was so excited about the, the potential. Fast forward to where we are today, there's, there's so much more developments, new companies being formed uh, in, in this space. And uh, as Jishan mentioned, lots of POCs. POCs have been started, some completed. Uh, many white papers being published, so it's a it's a very exciting time. Uh, Andrew, yeah, I think you know maybe adding on that, uh, taking it a little bit to the the bank perspective, I think that the nature of the conversations as well have evolved a lot and and matured a lot since uh, even just twelve months ago. I think remembering to a similar panel like this last year, uh, it was still very much a technology discussion or maybe a strategy discussion uh, you know that that you'd be having across you know all the different banks and and now increasingly you're getting really more of a front to back uh, you know many different groups involved many different groups providing their perspectives and uh, you're really starting to form a much fuller picture you know from client touch points all the way through to your uh, you know mid back office trying to really unpack what the implications of this are i think that kind of conversation was definitely not you know that what you would be having even just 12 months ago um at that you know with this level of commitment uh, from from different folks to really unpack what this means and and, and how to you know take it from that poc uh, onwards uh, or from that research onwards to something more and more tangible that's very enlightening. So yeah, I, I do agree with you, you know, because we were also on the same session last year and uh, very fortunate as a fintech firm, you know, to be working with you banks. Okay. And I do think that that's a very great collaborative approach uh, whereby we are starting to see more and more collaborations between first of all, multiple banks. Secondly, also multiple fintech firms in one single project where we could possibly do something together. Well, I guess it brings me to the next question. You know, what are the roles there for? Because this panel is about how are banks uh, preparing for the future of digital securities. Okay, so I would like to ask, you know, what are the roles that therefore banks can play? Um, I mean, in, in my view, and, and I think, I, you know, we often get this question in, in many other panels or forum, right? Is about, you know, is this new trend going to be a disruption? Is this the end of the financial industry as we know it today? Uh, and actually, I think experience has shown that, yes, there is actually rather than a disruption, we're probably talking about an accelerated evolution, combining, you know, the old world experience with the new technology and trying to, you know, find new opportunities, find new solutions to make things better, but not necessarily saying taking away what, what we have already. And so to me, when I look at a, a digital asset and digital securities, the way I look at it is basically it's a new type of asset class slash a new marketplace, right? And that's where naturally or inherently banks and, uh, you know, international institutions actually have a role to play because they can bring their experience in scalability in terms of connectivity, but also from a banking perspective, bringing liquidity and balance sheet to, uh, you know, safeguard the overall stability of the market. So that's at a very high level what I would say in terms of, uh, you know, what, what you know, uh, financial institutions and banks could, could, could play in, in, in that particular space. Yeah, just to just to add on, I, I think in, in addition to that, definitely, I think banks have a role to play with, with our uh, deeper understanding of the regulatory expectations. So so uh, just to cite an example, I think uh, we, OCBC had a partnership with an uh, Israeli fintech company and uh, who's new to Southeast Asia. So we were able to, to bring them in front of MAS. We were able to uh, get them uh, validated, uh, get their technology validated. We get the opportunity to work closely with them to test uh, their solution using on, on our platform. Uh, access to data and and, uh, and that help them be the reference uh, help us help them by using us as a reference case to to, to sell to some of the other banks in in this region so so i think banks definitely has have a very deep understanding of risk management very deep understanding of regulations and and uh, in, as, as what Chishan mentioned, this is an area where, where it's fast evolving and I think all parties can learn from each other, can, can come together to, to collaborate. Yeah, I think uh, the way that I see it is you know, banks have a, a lot of 
inherent advantages in, in some areas and, and fintechs in others. And when we are looking at a lot of POCs or technical simulation, I think working with the fintechs is good to, to get a grasp for an understanding of what's possible with the technology. But when you start talking about needing to scale that into a, you know, a real transaction uh, that starts to touch you know, real regulation, um, real cross-border considerations, uh, you know, real structuring and legal considerations, these are all things that um, you know, financial institutions, regardless if you're a bank asset manager, you know, th these are more the core competency or the skill set that, that would be there. And I think in our experience as well, and in some of the conversations with fintechs, as we are moving to that stage of the more you know, real transactions, it, it's drawing a lot more on, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, that that kind of front to back experience from from the financial institutions. I think that that's a, probably a good sweet spot where um, you know both both can really collaborate, uh, uh, you know, together to to try to to move these new ecosystems forward. Wow, that's very encouraging to hear from you. So, I mean, I, I heard from the three of you talking about how, okay, POCs could now be uh, implemented. And then, of course, with the leadership of the banks, with the, working together with the fintech firms, we can then bring it to an institutional scale uh, following your experiences and, of mm -hmm. course, your connections and experiences. I think that's really great. Okay, maybe we could expand on this topic for a moment and talk about you know, some more details about you know exactly okay for all the audience here who might be interested to know how could we possibly move you know something like a new technology based digital security project from POC to implementation and institu institutionalization. Yeah, and I, I guess that, that that's part of the, the the next stage of the life cycle of, of of the evolution, right? And 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 like 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 everybody said, right? I mean, POCs. I think by now most of the industry participants would be convinced that the technology is there, that there is definitely a use case for digital assets, whether it's through DLT, whether it's through other means, but that it definitely uh, enables more efficiencies in a way, right? Because uh, fundamentally, with, when you look at it, when whether it's tokenization, whether it's DLT, and and so on. It's about transforming how you look at transactional uh, uh, transac transactions and move into more uh, a, a, a concept of, of data sharing and data permissioning. And how do you actually accelerate then the exchange of information, the exchange of assets in a much more collaborative way? So um, as again, from a use case perspective, it's there. But I think to Andrew's and, and Jim's point, um, if you want to make it uh, mainstream, if you want it to be scalable and, and, and become really something that is a BAU, then you also need to give comfort to the regulators, to the market, to the investors that there is a stability and that there is a safety. And that's where, to me, again, being a new asset class, you know, yes, it's new asset class, yes, it's exciting, but you probably can still learn from your existing asset class risk and experience in mitigating those risks to provide in the space, for instance, where I am in the, in the custody services is Custody is trust, is safekeeping, ensuring that we understand the regulation, not just the letter, but actually the, the, the fundamental and the spirit of it to, again, make sure that this is not going to be uh, a hype for a couple of years. And then, you know, after a severe market incident, you know, things will disappear. So if we want this to be a long term growth, I think this is the, the next natural evolution and the conditions to actually, uh, uh, you know, move from POCs to uh, to a, a wide scale market a market adoption yeah so 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 exactly uh, so POCs are just experiments right POCs uh, are, are things that you do in a very restricted context in a in a very restricted time so so you you test the technology you test the, the business uh, angle so but when, when you want to scale it then it's, it's a rather different uh, perspective right so so from from my limited understanding and limited experience i think there are three probably three things that we we have been grappling with so so uh, from internal to external right? so, so from internal uh, no i really want to emphasize the importance of internal stakeholder buy-in so so there are many uh, different stakeholders with different perspectives used to doing things uh, in, in a certain way for, for many many decades so so how to how to get them to see the big bigger picture see the benefits and also i think most importantly address their, their concerns right that this is this is something that is that is viable this is something that can can actually add value to the organization so from an external perspective uh one one of some of the few things that we are bumping against is 
uh, finding the the right partners, right? So so when, when you have decided that this is something you want to do on the larger scale, who is a, is a good partner? And we're very thankful we have the opportunity to meet and and work very closely with a lot of very good companies, including including Stacks. Uh, so uh, then then in addition to that, uh, professional services firm. So so when we do uh, engage some of them, the, when when we try to assess. Uh, which projects they have really done in production, it's, it's, it's rather limited, right? So there's, there's a limited pool of people who, who can really uh, advise on it. Then I guess most, uh, last but not least, uh, probably probably standards and, and uh, alignment with other uh, other banks, uh, other, other consortiums is probably an, another area that probably would need a, a lot more work and a, a lot more support. Yeah, I like that that framing of it because I think that that is also it's very similar to probably the challenges and in, in, in areas that that we we've been observing as well and especially in the last twelve months. I think internally, uh, to that point on the stakeholder buy-in, I think one of the other challenges that you know tend to be there is that you know this topic is so fundamental, right? You're talking about a fundamental market infrastructure change, and when you change something at that level, the the knock-on effect is is pretty big. Pretty much everything, you know, in theory, is in scope to be affected. So, when I guess within a large institution or a large financial institution, you know, any one of them, uh, you, you either need, you need to balance the approach of going, you know, one by one to to every every single you know different component of the bank and and trying to you know solicit an opinion or a view. Uh, you need to balance that against, you know, having the right people in the organization that that do actually understand the whole thing. So not just the technology, the operations, but you know, through to you know some of the the market impact, the market implications, uh, you know, the the plumbing. This is the word I use a lot these days, like the plumbing of how it actually all works and comes together. And it's very hard to find, you know, people that just because the space is so new that that would have that entire view, payments and securities and, you know. Uh, you know, custody to issuance, like it's almost like ideally you have someone that knows all of it, but uh, they don't. And so then it ends up being um, kind of quite, quite a quite a big exercise to try to, to develop that that perspective so that people have the right strategic kind of uh, view. And then I think on the external point, I definitely agree with, you know, what was just mentioned, um, you know, around partners and ecosystem. I think there it's a uh, it's thinking about how to solve these chicken and egg problems uh, that will come up of, you know, no one wants to be the first first, but everyone kind of, kind of wants to do something interesting. Uh, and I think the, the phrase I liked, you know, um, that someone was sharing with me before was, you know, increasingly ambitious, uh, uh, you know, pilots or experiments. Uh, you know, that's probably the, the right way to think about it. Uh, so if we if we you know go on that type of basis, then um, you know, making sure we have that right ecosystem or uh, thinking about what the minimum viable ecosystem is and how to make sure that it's uh, extendable if your first, you know, transaction is successful. I think these are all then quite important in the upfront design considerations uh, when thinking about the, you know, moving from POC to pilot and, and setting the right foundation. Yeah, because Andrew, to some extent, I've, I've, I think that that ecosystem is also going to be a, a key condition for uh, broader liquidity access, right? Because you can have hundreds of different POCs, but if all of work, all of them work in isolation, if there is no interoperability, if there is no, no standards to lower the cost of interoperability, then again, there is going to be a diminishing effect in terms of attractiveness of that particular marketplace against others. And so uh, ultimately, I think this is going to be always, like you said, right, the chicken and egg, right? I mean, you want to be innovative, you want to, to be first mm -hmm. in the market, but at some stage, we also need to think about rather than everybody coming up with their own wheel, how do you actually put four wheels together to make a car, right? And and so that that's that's probably the, the next uh, the, the, the next logical st stage of evolution. Uh, although I think, as we said in the introduction, it, it's there is such a wide spectrum of different categories of digital assets and digital securities that it's also yeah. difficult to prioritize. So depending on who you speak to. Tokenized securities is going to be the number one priority. Others will tell you, no, 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 it's about crypto because Bitcoin prices is going up the roof for the last last two mm -hmm. years. Others would say, no, native uh, native digital securities is the future. So that's also an, a, probably from a planning perspective, especially in large organizations like ourselves, it's, it's sometimes also a big conversation internally to to bet on the right horses, if uh, if, if I can use that expression. Yeah, no, I, 100%. I think. Um... 
the, the thing is exactly exactly to that point. I think the, the liquidity and interoperability is, is pretty important, and I guess recognizing that in where we're at today, many of these new ecosystems probably don't have it, which then makes it hard to maybe get that initial business case. But thinking a bit longer term out, um, it's almost like there's a bit of a there's a couple of leap of faith assumptions that that need to be made to to get people moving, um, both within the organization as well as across the peers to ensure that. Uh, you're not just building something for a, like a subset of one, and which is also uh, doesn't get us to to where we need to get to. So I definitely agree. I think this this whole interoperability topic, um, ecosystem topic, generating liquidity is probably going to be a big focus. Uh, oh, it already was, but probably even more of a big focus going forward. And because every business case seems to cite that this they expect to be there, but how it actually happens is, is maybe not so straightforward. Yeah, I, I, I take a lot of comfort to hear that the, all, all three of us are, seem to be struggling with the same challenges, prioritization and, and uh, lots of interesting things, which which ones to, to work on and, and both internal and external challenges uh, that, that uh, we, we have to overcome. But uh, I, I think I'm very optimistic. I think this is this is really uh, exciting space. Lots of lots of good uh, opportunities to for value creation. Well, there's a lot of experience and uh, knowledge from the panel uh, so far. So I hope the audience is enjoying it. For sure, I am enjoying it right now because I'm learning a lot from you of how we can move these, you know, projects from POC to pilot to implementation and even at scale. You know, when we are able to deliver something interoperable and have multiple participants uh, who are mm -hmm. able to prioritize, you know, through the journey. Okay, how we can grow this project into a uh, life one. So. Uh, I especially uh, enjoy some of the terminology that you have been using, for example, plumbing and trying to make the uh, project more increasingly ambitious. So, of course, I also uh, pick up some points that were brought up just now by teaching about, you know, tokenized securities, digital assets, digital native, uh, you know, crypto, etc. Just staying on securities for now. Okay, because I do hear a lot about, you know, uh, tokenized securities, which are essentially, you know, uh, downstream tokenization of existing securities or digital native securities, whereby these are securities that are natively issued on a digital format. So I just want to ask uh, the panelists here, what do you think about you know, digital native versus tokenized securities? Uh, what is, which one is taking more uh, adoption right now? Which one seems to be the way forward? Or is it going to be in parallel and we're going to have both at the same time? Yeah, maybe I, I can give it a shot <laughs> and, and see uh, where, where we land on this one. I think. Uh, I think both the, the reality, as with most things, I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Like both will probably be required. So, uh, a tokenized security versus a digitally native security, I think, are they're actually very similar. I think the more that that at least um, you know, I've been looking at it, it started to to realize that the, the two you know, definitely link together. That there are probably use cases where one makes more sense than the other, uh, and certain products that depending on the existing, uh, call it, uh, you know, the cost, uh, the opportunity cost of changing, uh, you know, certain products are delivered on infrastructure today that's relatively efficient and others maybe not so much. And so, so that might drive, you know, more towards uh, structuring, uh, you know, technically and legally structuring your your transaction as a tokenized security versus security token. I think that that's one, let's say, broader consideration. And then the other one is, uh, I think around liquidity uh, to the extent that, and it links a bit to the interoperability point before, to the extent that the requirement is you need to have uh, classic liquidity available. Um, some of that classic liquidity, let's say, you know, with the main exchange, you know, the ones that we would be you know, familiar with might have regulatory you know, requirements that, that you need to be setting up the security in a certain way with a certain you know, ICSD or CSD, which which then drive your design choice towards more of a tokenized security setup than maybe a purely native security token. Uh, but but those would be maybe the two that jump out in my mind of one versus the other. How, which use case, um, depending on the use case, where you point them to and where you start to go into some of that structuring consideration. 
Yeah, I think I, I would agree with Andrew. I think there is the space for, for, for both. I, I don't think it's going to be necessarily one versus the other, and ultimately one one will will, will dominate. I think if you compare to, to today's world, you have private placement, you have IPOs, you've got you know, different ways of raising capital. But at the end of the day is what is going to be the liquidity that you're going to attract and at what cost and at what security or stability level, right? And depending on the levers that you want to play on both the investor side and on the issuer side, then you find the best uh, uh, suitable solution. Uh, and therefore, yes, of course, a completely native uh, uh, digital security has the attraction of it may be faster, it may be more, effic more efficient, it may be more peer-to-peer -peer direct access to the investor and therefore lowering as well cost. At the end of the day, would be if that becomes mainstream, would there be enough safeguards to ensure that the listing is as transparent as what you see today in exchange? I mean, if you, you have to remember also the history of why CSDs and exchange exist today is because before that, you know, there were more scams and there were more less control and there were more trans there were less transparency for investors to know exactly what they were buying. Uh, before the ICSD were, were were created 40 or 50 years ago, you know, the exchange of, of, of cross-border bonds was extremely complicated mm -hmm. because there was no no central place to do that. So I think, again, to my earlier point, similar risk uh, uh, remained the same. It's, I think it's just how do we play with the technology and with those different levers to make it more attractive and more make it more efficient to increase the, the, the pool of liquidity and increase the reach to a wider set of uh, uh, of investors as well, right? So, so I think in, in terms of, you know, ESG that uh, uh, Ben, your organization is, is, is very uh, active in, I, I think it's also about financial inclusiveness. So how do you make those uh, uh, investment products more accessible to, to, to a greater population, especially in, uh, in, in Asia, for instance? Yeah, to totally agree. I think there's there's probably a middle ground, and, and there's no you no know, lots of opportunities in both both areas. Uh, with 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 the, the smart contract, the, the digital native securities can, can unlock a lot of benefits. But uh, having said that, I think there's probably a, a little bit more scrutiny, a little bit more uh, understanding that all the different stakeholders that need to need to get on board. So so yeah, it's it's going to be an exciting space in the next few next few years. So hearing from the three of you, it also seems that, you know, in order for digital securities, be it native or tokenized to get adoption, it does seem that there still needs to be these uh, standards of uh, safety, um, security and uh, governance, okay, be it a native security or tokenized security or digital asset even, okay, it seems that these are very important. And I'm also hearing that, you know, smart contract technology could be used. So it comes to the question, you know, can technology deter prevent or even punish bad actors in this uh, spectrum here so that we could be able to drive the adoption of such uh, products. I wonder if anyone has any input on this. I mean, of course, I mean, I mean, I mean, technology tends to be a force for good, right? I mean, when, you know, we need control, it started with manual things that you put on the manual ledger and, and writing it down a hundred years ago and you move into maybe an excel spreadsheet you move into you know mainframe systems and today's you have dlt to share data and to have for instance node access i think that has been one of those great evolution of the understanding of the dlt technology of saying hey by the way because it's a it's dlt and because you have nodes you can actually grant uh, access to a regulator you can grant access to an auditor a supervisor your own mm -hmm. compliance team whoever but basically Again, you're using data as opposed to transaction, right? And so you mm -hmm. use that data to apply more control. So to some extent, technology can be a force of good and technology can help in improving that overall uh, safety and, 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 and safeguard of, of, of the investor's hard earned money, right? On the other end, technology, if, if not using the right boundaries, et cetera, can also create uh, new challenges. And we know that, and I, I won't go into the de details of you know some of those, Cryptocurrencies, unregulated, unpermissioned, that are used for money laundering, that are used for criminal funds, uh, repurposing, and, and so on. So that that's the other uh, 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 spectrum of, uh, of 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 the risk of, of technology when it's not properly controlled or supervised. And and so I think we'll, we'll again have to find some some balance in between the two. Yeah, I really struggle with this question uh, because the the first response with. The technology is an enabler right and so technology can be used for both good and and, and, and bad so so and uh so from from a this is rather relatively new uh development in the last 10 years uh so there, there's still there's still a lot of uncertainty there's still not as much understanding as it should be uh, maybe even on a regular 
legal perspective, maybe lack of lack of case law, for example. So, so I think there's there's huge opportunities for for bad actors uh, to do terrible things and and to take away the trust and and the integrity of the system, right? But, but having said that, I I kind of uh, understand where Jichen is coming from and agree. I think there's there's also a lot of uh, thinking that's gone in. There's there's a lot of uh, people looking to the governance looking at how to standardize things uh, to, to address some of these risks so so if, if we can uh, as, as an industry as as a consortium come together uh, think through the, the implications for, for smart contracts uh, accelerate standardization uh, uh, address dispute resolutions and so forth I think I think that will go a long way uh, towards uh, being able to use this technology for good. And, and ensuring that, that the integrity of the system is maintained. Yeah, I think uh, with both both points of, of uh, fellow panelists here, I would, I would say that I you know, tend to agree. Um, I think maybe the the perspective I would add here is I think it is important though to have an open mind on some of the. I call it the innovation, the technology innovation, right? That that is coming from, uh, let's say, even the the public, you know, uh, permissionless ecosystems, uh, just as a starting point to understand, you know, what if we did reimagine a concept of governance that, uh, you know, isn't enforced entirely by legal contracts alone, which has a certain limit to how how fast you could scale or how much you can scale that, depending on the scope of transactions you want to include. Uh, through to, um, you know, the implications of you know, the smart contracts in in, in uh, automating certain activities. I think that's important to to reflect and understand. But if we're talking about for financial institutions and regulated, you know, use case, highly regulated use cases, I think then the the part that becomes important, and I think Jishan put it very well, is the history. So it's it's uh, understanding the history of why the system has evolved to the way it has, and especially within large financial institutions, sometimes you will find that person that, you know, <laughs> certainly I have where they, you know, they've been here for 40 years, 50, like, you know, some really long time and, and they can tell you how this worked, you know, when it was you know, T plus, I don't know, 30 <laughs> settlement on some esoteric instrument, but understanding then the first principles of what, you know, what the risk really is that you're trying to, to address. And I think bringing those two things, that history plus, some of this open um, kind of the new technology itself, I think the combination of the two will probably land you at a point where the enabler is maybe for, on, on average, right, for the better. But I think if we kind of go too far in either direction, you either end up with exactly the same system as we have today, which maybe is not then worth, you know, the, the effort to, to go through all, all the work that we're doing, um, but also not, not, not take it too far in terms of, uh, yeah, depending on some of these use cases, you do have to kind of scale back from <laughs> from the extreme a little bit, and and find the right middle ground. And and I think I think another element that is going to be important is is also how how do you also raise that level of of understanding and knowledge, whether within our, our own respective firms in security in, in in technology and so on, but also at the regulator. I mean, we can see that the regulator are also starting to get more interest in understanding the drivers of the technology, but also the drivers of those mm -hmm. new business proposal and this business offering and trying to fit a framework into that, which sometimes is, can be quite difficult because again, some digital securities, depending on which jurisdiction may be seen in a different way, right? I mean, we all know about stable coin. We, we've seen last week, uh, uh, the, the, the president, the US president's office publishing the, 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 the findings on stable coin, a lot of, 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 of valid, valid elements in there. Uh, but again, I think, I think all those reflections would also then drive and adjust um, you know, some of those technology elements, uh, because I mean, maybe to be a bit controversial, uh, yeah, smart contracts can play a role. And again, it's a technology that can help. But then again, somebody would need to have an oversight on those smart, con on those smart contract, because mm -hmm. if you completely rely on, on machine, if you don't understand how the machine will do those smart, uh, a, a smart contract control, how do we ensure the output of, of that, uh, the same way as today, you get comfort from your lawyer. So, so those are elements that I think are, again, old risk at, uh, applied to new technology. And therefore, there is a need to also understand that new technology just to make sure that we're still, uh, in, still in the same safe zone, uh, if, 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 if I may. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It does seem like, you know, there is not one size fit all for sure. And also there needs to always be a middle ground. I for sure believe that technology could be used for good. It is an enabler, but it's definitely not enough. I think, uh, I think the panelists have also shared that technology can uh, end up in the hands of bad actors. So it is important to have, you know, partners like yourselves getting involved. So I think we are uh, fortunate to be working with banks like yourself, because I do think that, you know, from the conversation so far, banks are able to provide the experience uh, the safety and the governance, you know, that would be really important for uh, investors, okay, in general. So I think that's great. Okay, we sort of agree that technology is great. It could be used as long as it's used by the right party for the right intention. And I think that's where it's also good that, you know, we have having this conversation in the session uh, with banks. Uh, and also some points were brought up about regulatory or regulators just now, right? So a slightly controversial question here, noting that all of us are based in Singapore or Hong Kong. Okay. Do you have a view about how, you know, these Asian financial hubs like Singapore and Hong Kong compare towards the financial hubs in US? US or Europe in terms of the regulatory climate for digital assets and securities? And if there's any difference, would there be any way to improve? Yeah, it's great. We are recorded. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'll just share, share maybe my opinion, right? Uh, uh, and I won't necessarily you know, I, I wouldn't go into the comparison and, and providing a scorecard for, for one, one, one country or another or another region. I, I, I think in my views, there, there are obviously, you know, certain jurisdictions that are much more advanced in terms of their thought, in terms of how they want to do. And obviously, Singapore and Hong Kong are, are, are definitely leading in, in, in Asia, but it doesn't mean that there are no other places in the world or in the region that, that are very active too. Uh, but I think more importantly, um, and, and being based in Singapore and, and observing some, some of the things that uh, MAS does, et cetera. I think what, what MAS understands very well is also the fact that, you know, it's not just about Singapore regulation, right? It's about how do you make cross-border, how do you make collaboration with other regulators and to make sure that the cross-border flow is both also being addressed. Because one of the challenges that I see is, even though we've said that over the last 12 to 24 months, that there's been a lot of, uh, you know, additional consultation, additional views from different regulators in the world to put some framework around digital assets, stable coins, CBDCs, and so on and so on. Sometimes it's not completely aligned. And therefore, for operators like us, Standard Chartered, we operate in so many different markets. If I offer a service of, let's say, custody of digital assets based in Singapore, but I deal with uh, investors in Thailand or in the US, in the UK, and if all those different regulators are not aligned in the views of what constitutes the digital securities, what constitutes a stable coin, what constitutes a payment token, et cetera, it's going to be very difficult to operate. And so to, to me, I think uh, one thing that I cannot serve is, is I think inherently, I think that uh, Singapore MS is, is much more uh, uh, keen to have that cross, cross, cross border type of conversation, thinking about the stability of, the mar of, of its markets, thinking about the stability of its own community, but also involved in a, in, 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 in a, in a wider global community as well. So I, I think that's something that, that is important uh, because otherwise we're going to have, again, a risk of arbitrage of regulation. And I, I think eventually that wouldn't be uh, necessarily a, a good thing either. Yeah, I, I, I could have completely it. I think the, the, the MAS has proven time and again that it's, it's really progressive and, uh, and with the, the interactions that we have had with, with them, uh, they, they come across really very uh, balanced, very progressive. They're very uh, risk proportionate. They're willing to, to listen, willing to uh, discuss and address the issues together in, in a very collaborative uh, approach, both, both our policymakers perspective and the private sector perspective. So, so it's, been, it's been great having them as a partner. Uh, just, just this conference itself is, is, a, is a case in point, right? How, how they launch all the initiatives and how they exceed the different uh, consortiums and get get people going and build some of the basic infrastructure. So, so it's it's definitely way way ahead of many other juris jurisdictions. Yeah, I would say um, similar similar kind of sentiment that uh, you know Singapore, I think, is is quite quite progressive in, in trying to you know, really take a structured approach to thinking about, you know, where something, uh, uh, you know, could fit into an existing regulation. It's just a classification problem. So just as, uh, you know, as was mentioned earlier, um, 
do we agree on you know what what type of instrument is what thing and then you can kind of extrapolate which which regulation it needs to fall under and then where there are some areas that are uh, a little bit outside of that perimeter you know trying to supplement that with uh additional guidance or, or or new regulation i think is is probably a reasonable approach and i think probably in other jurisdictions around the world as well it seems like you know that 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 is something that we're seeing i think ultimately there would need to be some convergence uh, in, in the thinking, or at least in the principles, so that there's not a uh, both arbitrage as well as uh, complexity, and in, in essentially, um, I guess, like segregating. The, back to the point on liquidity, segregating all the different pools of liquidity because you, you can't actually access that market um, based on the way you, you know, have structured your secu- your your tokenized security or security token. Um, you know, th- th- these would be then more practical, you know, transaction considerations that you know, would come up. Uh, you don't want to make it too hard for, let's say, the industry. Uh, or if there's too many different, you know, standards around the world, then it would be a practical implication for financial institutions like, 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 like uh, the folks here on this panel would be, you know, the the, the structuring complexity then gets very high, and and you start to maybe lock out different investors, and the interoperability and the liquidity isn't isn't really there because you can't do the cross border. I think. Uh, you know that that's where it goes. I think in the meantime, in the pilots, it's just then about um, you know selecting in a in a smart way, right? How how, how you can demonstrate still what, you know a learning that you want to get, but and and shows the path to what that you know, interoperability looks like. But ultimately, the the regulation would need to eventually catch up with how you know those, pi- those these types of pilots evolve to to ensure that it's somewhat harmonized. That's great. Yeah, I really like the point about cross-border because you know whatever we do has to be cross-border being a financial hub after all. Uh, in fact, I was reminded just yesterday, I was listening to something else. Uh, it was about entrepreneurship and uh, startups in Singapore. So obviously it came from uh, one of these government agencies, right? And they were saying the, the, the approach is that, you know, being here in Singapore, I mean, I'm based in Singapore, so I'm quite fortunate in the sense that the approach has always been, although we are from Singapore, we have to be global on day one. You know, the way that we design and the way we approach the problem statement and the way we want to deliver a product has to be able to be portable and uh, globalized on day one. So I think that's something that's been very helpful uh, in the, the Asian context. I believe it's the same in Hong Kong. Yeah, and I guess that that's therefore uh, part of the considerations that I think we need to have uh, be from us as a fintech firm or from uh, banks who are working with us. Okay, how could we then therefore design the the, the, the future whereby you know, whatever that we're working on today could be used on a cross-border basis. I think that gives us enough time for the last question of the day before we go into the Q&A, which is you know, following up on that. Okay, is there, I mean, we talk about technology, we talk about banks providing their, uh, uh, playing their roles, we talk about regulate, regulations just moments ago. Okay, and in conclusion, is there anything that, you know, from your perspective, Okay, working in a bank. Okay, is there anything that can or should be improved? Okay, in order to drive the adoption of blockchain technology for digital assets and securities. Um, to, I mean, to me, I, I think I think it's, it's many of the points that we've touched already, right? I mean, I mean, to me, I think it's going to be, you know, how how do we collectively come up with some ecosystem that are going to eventually form a utility? For the core of, of, of the technology to ensure some level of interoperability at a, at a low cost, and then you know for regulations to converge so that you you, you ease the cross border uh, ability to to transact and and, and to offer solutions uh, you know across across multiple jurisdiction, and towards that then come up with different offering. But but I think that that's to me standards interoperability and the regulatory framework that is consistent to, to some nature. It doesn't mean that everything has to be one single regulation and governed by a single regulator, but it, it, ne- it needs to be fairly consistent. The same way as today, we can offer chess services in you know, 20, 40 markets. Uh, they're all regulated by their own, own, own regulators, but 80%, 90% of it is roughly the same in terms of understanding of how it should be regulated. So if we converge into that, and if we have the right solution for liquidity access and distribution, I, I think that that will be something that will be being standing for, uh, for, for the long term. Yeah, I think um, for, for me it would be to to add, you know, adding to those 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 important points from an external perspective. It's uh, then both an internal external uh, 
view towards you know how, how can we start really moving on these minimum viable ecosystem uh, to to really get get some of these pilots out there. I think that that's going to be pretty important to to provide some real learnings both for the industry, for regulators, for for banks uh, to progressively get the the, the buy-in right to, to to continue to to be more and more ambitious and. And building up a business case, I, I don't think because because of complexity of this topic, this is not one. Um, let's say that yeah. from a classic strategy perspective, you you would have the business case up front, and and you can kind of know exactly how this is all going to play out. It's probably a, you know, something more to the effect of like managing your optionality and making sure you are you, you do have uh, you're building option value for yourself, uh, for the industry, for, for your firm. And, and trying to balance that. And I think, yeah, to, to that extent, it's, it's about being flexible. It's about, you know, having more of these uh, ecosystems where you, you can encourage a couple of people to, to everybody push a little bit, and then you get to the next step. And, you know, each progressive step is probably how, you know, it realistically will we'll get to the, the end state. Yeah, to, to, totally agree. And nothing much more to, to add. Uh, definitely standards, definitely uh, the ecosystem partners coming together, uh, engaging the reg regulators as well. Just maybe one one small point uh, to, to add is even at, at some point, we probably need to think about uh, from the investor perspective, from, from the, the market perspective, right? How, how to educate, how to bring them up to speed, how to make it as easy as, as, as possible to, to make these transactions uh, uh, compared to what they are used to so so but yeah lots lots of interesting uh, good things to keep us all occupied for the next few years yeah and i think jim, jim that, that's a good good point because i think by by interoperability it's also about integration and connectivity with the existing traditional world asset right because i think for still a long time there would still be a mix of of, of investment portfolios so there will be a lot of investors that would want to have digital assets traditional assets cryptocurrencies and so on and at some point there is also going to be an element of how can you actually provide a comprehensive solutions across those different multi uh, uh, multi asset classes great 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 that's a lot of perspectives from the session i think it was very fruitful for us so uh, just like to turn over to q a session right now so for all the audience okay you could actually type in your questions uh inside the chat box on the right hand side okay there's a q a box and also a chat box so just be Please feel free to type in the questions. I will see them and I will read them out whenever I see them. Okay, so let's just wait moments for anybody to put in a question. And while waiting, I just like to emphasize that, you know, this has been a lot of uh, learning today for, for me, especially. Okay, learning from how uh, banks are thinking about digital securities, learning about how, you know, banks will approach bringing a project from ideation to POC to institutionalization and scaling up. So that all that is a lot of wisdom, you know, from uh, the, the, the three of you. So I'm very grateful for that. So as I said in my introduction in the beginning, I think I'm the luckiest person today, you know, to be able to be on the same panel as you. Yep. So still holding on for questions. Anyone at all? Okay, it looks like they are being kind to us. <laughs> or maybe it's just lunchtime coming up. Yep. Otherwise, maybe it's the double eleven sales going on online, just distracting <laughs> them. But thanks for your time anyway. I see many of you joined the session. Okay, just a kind reminder to anyone, uh, to everyone. Okay, uh, before we sign off, is that uh, the sessions are going to be available on this platform. Uh, if you just look into schedule, you'll be able to see every this session plus every other session that we already had. So everything is pre-recorded. You'll be able to see the panel sessions. Uh, and the various type of uh, demos and showcase that we have already made available available for playback right now okay into the uh, on on the schedule so just please feel free look at these sessions any one of them that captures your interest they'll be available for i think a few more days after even after this event Okay, so uh, for now, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join this session. Also, thanks very much to my guest panelists. Uh, it's been great uh, to hear from you, and I hope that okay, we can learn and grow together with each other as we the industry further develops. So once again, thanks everyone. Signing off for now. See you. Uh, take care and have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everyone. Bye.